Hello, and welcome back to General Chemistry 1. My name is Daniel, and in this video we're going to be taking an introduction into chemical bonding. That's how, ad mul how multiple atoms can form bonds between one another, and thus be attracted and held together. So we've been talking about molecules and how the fact that they're bonded, especially in our salts, which are our metal and a nonmetal. So when we have that, that's what's known as an ionic bond, because we have two different charged species attracted to one another. Mathematically, their attraction to one another is given by what's known as Coulomb's Law. As we see in this expression for Coulomb's Law, there's two distinct variables that we have to be aware of. The first one are these Qs, Q1 and Q2. And those just refer to the charges of the ions. So that means you could have a plus one for a plus one anion, a negative one for a negative one anion, so on and so forth. And also, the fact that there's a certain distance r between the two ions. So, in this equation, a negative value for V indicates an attractive force. And what that means is that opposite charges of ions attract. And that makes sense from the salts we've seen. They're going to be composed of positively charged cations and negatively charged anions. What we also see is this, di is this um, importance of the distance between two ions. So what we can think about is if the two ions are too far apart, then they're not going to experience any kind of force between one another. But also if they're too close together, they might be starting to repel each other. So what we'll see in one of the next few slides is a diagram of how we can determine what the best distance between two species are is. In the meantime, let's think about the other forces that go into play when we're thinking about the attraction or repulsion of ions away, from, away or towards one another. So there's three main forces. The first one we can think about is electron-electron repulsion. So that's just the repulsion of two negative charges. We can also think of pr the repulsion of protons from one another, since they're two positive charges. And then finally, and this is our only attractive force, is the attraction of protons and electrons. That's a positive and negative charge being attracted together. And as we said before, there's a certain best distance between two species where the attraction of protons and electrons is maximized, and those two repulsive forces are minimized, so as to give us the optimal attractive force. And the that a distance between two atoms or ions is going to be what's known as the bond length of that bond. So let's see graphically how that occurs. So first let's look at um, A. A over here we have two species very close together. So when we have the two species very very close together what's going to happen is there's going to be a steep rise in energy due to repulsion of the protons and the electrons in the um, two species. So that's what we get where we get this little portion of the curve, this very high energy when they're f too much too close together. If we bring them a little bit further and further apart, we'll eventually reach state B, where we see you have this energy well, basically this minimum point of energy. So the formation of a bond is only going to occur when it's energetically favorable to do so. That means that the energy of the two ions or atoms in a bond has to be less than it would be with the two far apart. That's the entire reason why a bond forms. So at point B, this is at our bond length when we have attractive forces maximized and repulsive forces are minimized. Whatever energy this occurs at in terms of length is going to be our bond length. Then as we go to C and D, as we go to C over here, we see that at distance beyond the bond length, the interactions occur between the ions, but the attractive forces aren't maximized because they're starting to get too far away from each other. And eventually we get to point D. Our baseline energy, our zero point, it, because since our energies on this scale are all relative, our zero point comes when our two ions are at infinite distances away from one another, meaning that they would have no interaction between one another. So those are the four kinds of different states we can see when we're trying to form a bond. We can have them too close together, too far apart, or just at this perfect distance, this bond length of attractive interactions between the two species. So that's how you can determine a bond length energetically. 
let's now look at covalent bonds. So in the, this, the previous graph applies to both ions and in covalent bonds, but there's a small difference. As we've said in a previous video, ionic bonds involve a transfer of electrons, but covalent bonds involve the sharing of electrons between two atoms. The degree of which those electrons are shared is determined by electronegativity. So as you recall, electronegativity is just the strength of attraction an atom has towards shared electrons in a covalent bond. So what that means then is that if you're bonding together two non-identical atoms, you're going to have a non-equally shared, sh non-equal sharing of electrons. Let's say you had something like carbon bonded to carbon. Well then, their electronegativities are the same. The, ch d the difference in electronegativity is zero. And so the bonds, the electrons there would be perfectly shared between those two carbons. However, in our oxygen-hydrogen sample we see here, there's a significantly large um, electronegativity difference. This is what leads to what's known as a dipole moment in that bond. A dipole moment is just another word for saying that we have partial positive, partial negative charges that are occurring. And we can draw that like so. So what that arrow means is that we have a positive charge, partial charge on the hydrogen and a negative partial charge on the oxygen. And that's just because oxygen has a greater electronegativity. And so the shared electrons in that covalent bond between them is going to lie closer to the oxygen. And this give, will give rise to another, another phenomenon called polarity, which we'll see later in the video. For now, we can talk about three types of bonds we've seen. There's ionic bonds, which involve the full transfer of electrons between species. That's going to occur in the um, bonding of anions and cations between one another, because those are fully ionized species. And so these ionic bonds contain the highest electronegativity difference, with usually with metals and nonmetals, given about above two. Polar covalent bonds are shared electron bonds, but there's a dipole moment in those bonds, meaning that there's an electronegativity difference, so that means the more electronegative atom is going to have its greater sharing of the electrons in the covalent bond. And so that's just known as pol polar covalent bond. And obviously this difference is going to be more great when um, the electronegativity difference is greater. And then finally we have nonpolar covalent bonds, which is just bonds between identical atoms. So when that occurs, there's no electronegativity difference, and hence the electrons are completely and equally shared in between the two atoms in the bond. Okay, so those are the three kinds of general bonds we're going to be talking about in this course. What we're going to primarily focus in on now, since we've been talking about a lot about ionic species in the previous videos, is we're going to be talking about our I covalent bonds, our polar covalent and our just normal covalent bonds. So when we're looking at dipole moment in particular, it's useful for us not to look at individual bonds only, but the dipole moments that occur throughout a molecule. This can re give rise to molecular polarity or molecular nonpolarity. So let's first define those two terms. So if we have a molecule with polar covalent bonds but has multiple dipole moments that cancel out one another, that's going to cancel out all of the dipole moments. That's what's known as a nonpolar molecule. If you look in methane, for example, the CH4 on the right, we see that there's four CH bonds. If we drew out the dipole moments for those, that would look something like this. So what we can see here is that each of these bonds is a polar covalent bond, right? But due to the symmetry of the molecule, the dipole moments are going to cancel out. We see that this one would cancel out with that one, and top down, this one would cancel out with this one. So that's what makes this molecule a nonpolar molecule. And we can see that's because this molecule is also symmetrical. Symmetry is what give, gives rise to nonpolarity in a molecule. 